The Expulsion of the Acadians The history of the Americas, from their discovery by Columbus till the founding of modern nation-states, has been the struggle among European powers for the largest and richest sections of the continents. In particular, England and France have struggled for control of most of North America. Many tragedies and disasters have marked this conflict, but few have been as heart-rendering as the expulsion of the Acadians in 1755. Acadia refers to what are now the maritime provinces of Canada, New Brunswick, Prince Edward Island, and Nova Scotia. In 1605, a French expedition under De Mont and Champlain established an agriculture settlement at Port Royal in present-day Nova Scotia. Although Port Royal and other colonies had very mixed success, there was a gradual increase of French settlement through the 17th century. By 1710, the French or Acadian population had reached 2,100. In 1710, Port Royal fell to the English, and the Treaty of Utrecht in 1713 confirmed British ownership of Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. By this treaty, the Acadians, that is the French-speaking inhabitants, were allowed to stay or leave the country as they pleased. The majority of inhabitants of Acadia were French and were still being influenced by agents from France and Quebec. This made their loyalty to Britain very doubtful in time of war. Governor Phillips attempted to get the Acadians to swear an oath of allegiance to King George of England, and Phillips was able in 1729 to get the French settlers to agree to a modified oath with the understanding that they would not have to fight against the French and their Indian allies. The Acadians remained neutral during the fighting between Britain and France in 1744-45 to 45 in Nova Scotia. In 1749, the British established a new capital for Nova Scotia at Halifax and began to bring in English-speaking settlers. Because of threats from the French and Indians, most of these settlers remained close to Halifax. British skirmishes with the French and Indians continued, and a new war between France and England was approaching. Governor Lawrence decided that it was time to settle the Acadian question. He ordered the Acadians either to take an unqualified oath of allegiance to England or to face expulsion from the colony. At that time, in 1755, there were troops and ships from New England in the area, and it seemed like an opportune time to round up the Acadians and ship them out. When the Acadians refused to take the oath which might oblige them to fight against France, the British rounded up 6,000 of the 8,000 Acadians, burned their homes, and shipped them away to British colonies of Virginia, the Carolinas, and as far away as the mouth of the Mississippi River. Several of the transport ships sank, drowning all on board, and the Acadians died from disease and hardship. Since the expulsion order did not come from London, it has been suggested that Governor Lawrence had personal reasons for the expulsion. It may have been greedy for the land and possessions confiscated from the Acadians. Others say there was the genuine fear for the English position in North America and that Lawrence was only protecting the interests of the colony. Acadians still live in maritime Canada today. Almost 2,000 fled into the woods and eluded the roundup. Another 2,000 Acadians later returned from exile to take the oath of allegiance. Many stories were told of their sufferings. One tale relates how on the very day of his wedding, a bridegroom was seized by the British and transported from the colony. His bride wandered for many years through the American colonies trying to find him. At last, when she was old, she found him on his deathbed. The shock of finding him and his death soon caused her death. This is the story of Henry W. Longfellow's poem, Evangeline. The Florida Everglades Southern Florida stretches south, dividing the Atlantic Ocean from the Gulf of Mexico. Stretching further south is the Florida Keys. These coral islands are the southernmost part of the United States. Since much of southern Florida is close to sea level, it's very swampy. The famous Everglades are wetlands where tall grass and bunches of trees grow. Part of these swamps has been drained for agricultural land. The soil is rich, and market gardening is an important activity. The Everglades that remain are too wet to be used for farming. The Everglades are a river of grass. 
The deeper water areas stay wet all year, but the shallower pools dry up in the dry season. Some of the water has been drained off for agricultural purposes, making the Everglades drier. Nonetheless, the best way to travel in this region is by airboats. These high boats can go through water and sail over clumps of grass. Besides the wet grasslands, southern Florida has smaller areas of tropical forest. These areas of hardwood trees are called hammocks, and they are rich in animal and plant life. Along much of the coast are mangrove trees, which provide important nesting grounds for wild birds. The Florida Keys stretch 200 miles from Miami southwest. These islands are tropical in climate. Fishing and tourism are important industries. Because of its subtropical nature, the animal and plant life of southern Florida differs from other parts of the United States. Characteristic animals are alligators and crocodiles. Alligators prefer fresh water and usually live inland, while crocodiles live in salt water along the coast. Both animals are considered dangerous. Alligator wrestling is considered a sport for the brave or foolhardy. Probably Florida is the most famous for its birds. At one time, many species were almost extinct. Their long feathers were used on women's hats. Now the law protects them. Florida has at least six species of herons, several egrets, wood storks, white ibises, and cormorants. Characteristic Florida birds are the purple gallinule, the aninga, the limpkin, flamingos, and roseate spoonbills. Many of these birds are notable for their size, coloring, and interesting habits. Notable animals include the key deer, a miniature form of the white-tailed deer. There are also panthers or cougars, bobcats, marsh rabbits, mangrove squirrels, round-tailed muskrats, and the manatee. Naturally, the Everglades are home to many reptiles. Snakes are common, both water snakes and land species. There are four poisonous varieties. Both land and sea turtles abound, and lizards are fairly common. Fishing is a major industry. Sports fishermen go to sea in search of trophies such as marlin, sailfish, and tarpon. Smaller fish are caught commercially. Freshwater sport fish include bass and gar. After many decades of work to protect the animals and plants of the Everglades, the region finally became a national park in 1947. It is the third largest park in the USA and covers one and a half million acres. Within the park live 300 kinds of birds, 30 kinds of mammals, 65 kinds of reptiles and amphibians, and nearly 1,000 species of flowering plants. Of course, it is a major tourist attraction. The Great Walls of China. The Great Wall of China is famous in North America, and many tourists would like to travel there. However, most North Americans don't know very much about Chinese history. That is changing now, as China is becoming an important subject for study in the West. The settled communities of China were targets for nomadic raids since earliest times. For much of its early history, China was not fully unified. However, Shi Wang, who died in 210 B.C., united the whole country. Then he set about defending China from the northern nomads. It seems likely there have been defensive walls in the north before. However, Shi Wang had a wall constructed across the entire north of China. This defensive wall extended for almost 2,000 miles and had 25,000 towers. Such walls were very expensive to build. They also required huge numbers of men to construct them and later to defend them. Even so, the Great Wall did not stop nomadic invasions altogether. Not long after Shi Wang's death, a tribe called the Huns crossed the wall. The emperor Hu Ti, who expanded Chinese power beyond the wall, defeated them. Centuries later, the Mongols to the north of China were united under Genghis Khan. The Mongols attacked China, and Kublai Khan, grandson of Genghis, became the first non-Chinese emperor of China in 1279. Eventually, the Chinese rebelled and overthrew their Mongol rulers. Nonetheless, the Mongols remained a threat. In 1449, they destroyed a Chinese army and captured the emperor. A new Great Wall was begun to keep the Mongols out. This is the wall which tourists visit today and which is pictured on Chinese stamps. 
Construction continued for 200 years. While some parts were built off packed earth, much of the wall was built of stone, brick, and rubble. This is why it took so long. Stones had to be quarried and bricks baked and carried to the site. Laborers, peasants, soldiers, and criminals were forced to work on the wall. Large and small forts and watchtowers carefully guarded the wall. Nearly a million soldiers were stationed along it. The Chinese defenders lit fires when the enemy was sighted. Plumes of smoke and cannon shots told that the enemy was advancing and how many there were. By 1644, the new wall was almost completed. That same year, however, an internal uprising overthrew the emperor. This revolt was partly caused by the high taxes demanded to pay for the wall. The emperor's men invited the nomadic Manchu tribe to come through the gates in the wall to help put down the revolt. The Manchus came, but they stayed and ruled China for several hundred years. Since the Manchus ruled both north and south of the wall, they did not care about maintaining it. Many parts fell into disrepair, and some completely disappeared. Today, the parts that remain are a major tourist attraction. The Great Wall of China is one of the wonders of the world, even if it really didn't succeed in its purpose of keeping the northern nomads out of China. The Internet. The first working computers in the 1950s and 1960s were large mainframe machines. In some ways, they were like large calculating machines. The U.S. government, the military, and businesses and institutions used them for specific tasks. For example, they might be used to handle the payroll. As more uses were found for computers, the need to transfer data from one computer to another became a concern. In 1969, the U.S. government sponsored a program to explore ways for computers to transfer data over telephone lines. The first internet was created with four computers linked together. Of course, computer use increased beyond anyone's expectations. Standards were developed that describe how data was to be transferred between computers. A common language for commands and communications emerged. Operating programs such as MS-DOS, Unix, Macintosh, and Windows came into existence. The internet quickly expanded beyond government and military uses. The PC became the standard form of computer. Private agencies acted as hosts for internet usage. Around 1982, there were 213 hosts. By 1986, there were 2,300. Today, there are millions. The role of computers expanded so quickly that the USSR, which had discouraged computer use, found itself left behind by the USA. Part of the reason for the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1989 was that they had fallen too far behind the United States in high-tech areas to ever catch up. One of the most popular uses of the computer is electronic mail or email. You can send a letter by computer over the internet to anywhere in the world in seconds or less, and it doesn't cost anything extra. Now data can be transferred great distances almost instantaneously. Another major internet use is the World Wide Web. In the early days, all web pages were text only. In the 1990s, it became possible to make web pages interactive and multimedia. Interactive means that readers could click on items on the web page and get more information. They could also communicate directly with the web page owner. Multimedia means that web pages were no longer text only. They could also have graphics. Film, video, and audio. This has helped to turn computers into popular entertainment. Nowadays, people spend hours every day surfing the net. However, there are some problems. For some people, computers are addictive. Many businesses are trying to control employees using the net during working hours. Since the internet includes just about every kind of information, not all of it is good. You can find directions on how to become a criminal or a terrorist. There are scam artists who want to cheat you out of money. There are also aggressive pornography salesmen, not to mention people who want to kill your computer with viruses. Since the internet is not closely regulated, it's up to individual users to follow computer etiquette. Parents need to supervise their children's use of the net. 
Although the Internet has some disadvantages, many people see the net as one of the greatest invention of modern times. The Planetarium All around the world, stargazing is a popular activity. The night sky lit up with stars is one of the most impressive scenes in nature. Besides its natural beauty, people study the night sky for many reasons. Some believe that they can read the future in the stars. Others think that the stars influence the weather, while some people worship the stars and the planets. There is a problem with stargazing. If the night is cloudy, people on the ground cannot see the stars. Also, bad weather makes being outside at night uncomfortable. Besides, not everybody wants to stay up late at night. A planetarium is an ideal solution to all these problems. A planetarium is usually a large dome-covered building. It has seating like a theater. The program here is a star show. A special projector throws a picture of the night sky on the ceiling of the planetarium theater. Like a movie projector, the planetarium projector can show a constantly changing program. It can show how the stars look right now, how they looked thousands of years ago, and how they will look in the future. Planetariums can be both entertaining and educational. School children can go to learn about the nine planets of the solar system or about the various groupings of stars. Planetarians can teach you how to find the stars and planets yourself when you're out at night. There can also be dramatic showings about changes to the universe over time. This is also a way to view special phenomena like Halley's Comet, which only appears once in a lifetime. Planetarians can also show how ancient people view the skies. Shepherds living out under the sky imagine that groups of stars represented wonderful people and huge animals. Stories were told about these constellations. Sometimes the story explained how the people or animals became stars. For example, why Orion, the mighty hunter, is chasing Taurus the bull. Planetarians can project these figures on their screen. They can also speed up changes in the heavens. It takes about 28 days for the moon to travel through all its phases. Changes in the moon or in the sun can be shown easily. Planetarians can also show the sky the way it appears in another part of the world or the way it appeared on a famous historical occasion. Special heavenly phenomena, such as a meteor shower, can also be demonstrated. Things that appear only rarely in the real sky can be shown every night. A planetarian is usually concerned to put into special programs to keep its audience coming back. Since the heavens are always moving and changing, there is no shortage of ideas for programmers. Alexander Graham Bell The Victorian period was a time of many new inventions. Earlier discoveries such as the steam engine, the screw propeller, the power of electricity, and the possibility of sending messages along a wire were now applied to everyday life. Inventors such as Thomas Edison and Nikola Tesla explored new methods for harnessing electric power. Some of the greatest discoveries were made by Alexander Graham Bell. Bell was born in Scotland in 1847. Both his father and grandmother taught speech methods and worked with deaf and dumb children. Alexander was also interested in this work, especially as his mother was almost deaf. Alexander's two brothers died of tuberculosis, and he himself contracted the disease. So his parents decided to leave Scotland for a drier, healthier climate. They moved to Bradford, Ontario, Canada, and lived in a roomy, comfortable house overlooking the Grand River. Today, the Bell Homestead is an historical museum that attracts visitors from all over the world. At that time, Canada did not have a lot of business opportunities, so Alexander found a job teaching speech in Boston, USA, but he returned to Brantford every summer. In Boston, Bell married one of his deaf students. His father-in-law suggested that there were good business opportunities in inventing communication devices. Bell soon developed a method for sending more than one telegraph message at the same time. While working on improving the telegraph, Bell and his assistant Thomas Watson found a way to send the human voice over wires. On August 10, 1876, Bell sent the first telephone message over wires strung between Brantford and Paris, Ontario, eight miles away. 
The telephone caused an international sensation, with government leaders asking to have one. But Bell didn't stop there. He worked on the recording properties of wax cylinders and other approaches to flat phonograph records. He also developed the photophone, which later led to the development of the motion picture soundtrack. Bell worked on these inventions at his laboratory in Washington, D.C., but he didn't like the hot, humid summer weather there, so Bell began looking for a new place to spend his summers. He decided to build a summer home in Cape Breton Island, Nova Scotia. The island reminded Bell of his native Scotland. Now he had space during the summer to do experiments outside. He soon began to experiment with flying machines. Bell designed and tested huge kites, hoping to come up with a frame for a flying machine. Along with some enthusiastic friends, Bell also experimented with airplanes. On February 23, 1909, one of these planes flew through the air for a half a mile. This was the first airplane flight in the British Empire. The Alexander Graham Bell Museum in Baddock, Nova Scotia, displays many of these inventions. Bell was also interested in making a faster boat. Since much of a boat stays under water, the water resistance slows the boat down. Bell thought that if you could raise the boat out of the water, it would go much faster. Working on Cape Breton Island, Bell and his friends developed the hydrofoil, a boat that would skim the surface of the water at high speeds. Hydrofoils are in use in many places today. Every time people use the telephone, listen to a recording, watch a movie or television, or ride on a hydrofoil, they owe a debt to that great inventor, Alexander Graham Bell. The Story of Anne Frank War, persecution, and economic depression affect not only adults, but also old people, children, babies, the sick, and the handicapped. Since history is written mostly about politicians, soldiers, intellectuals, and criminals, we don't read very often about how events affect ordinary people. Now and then, a special book will shed light on what it was like to live in the midst of terrible events. Such a book is the diary of Anne Frank. Anne Frank was born in Frankfurt am Main, Germany, in 1929. Her father, Otto Frank, was a businessman who moved the family to the Netherlands in 1934. In Amsterdam, Otto started a company selling pectin to make jams and jellies. Later, he began a second company that sold herbs for seasoning meat. Otto Frank had decided to leave Germany because of the policies and personality of the new German Chancellor Adolf Hitler. Hitler had a personal hatred, not only for Jewish people, but also for everything Jewish. He felt that one way to strengthen Germany and solve its problems was to kill or drive out all the Jews. Hitler also felt that other groups, such as blacks, gypsies, the handicapped, homosexuals, and a chronically unemployed should be eliminated. Then only strong, healthy, true Germans would be left. Since Hitler had a plan to solve Germany's economic problems, he received a lot of popular support. Very few Germans realized that he was mentally and emotionally unbalanced and would kill anyone who got in his way. The Frank family was Jewish, and they felt that they would be safe in the Netherlands. However, in May 1940, Germany invaded the Netherlands and soon took over the government. In 1941, laws were passed to keep Jews separate from other Dutch citizens. The following year, Dutch Jews began to be shipped to concentration camps in Germany and Poland. Just before this began, Anne Frank, Otto's younger daughter, received a diary for her 13th birthday. Less than a month later, Later, the whole family went into hiding. Otto Frank had made friends with the Dutch people who worked with him in his business operations. Now these friends were ready to help him, even though hiding Jews from the authorities was treated as a serious crime. Behind Otto Frank's business offices, there was another house that was not visible from the street. Here the Franks moved many of their things. Only a few trusted people knew they were living there. The Franks moved into these small rooms on July 6, 1942, and they lived there with another Jewish family, the Van Pels, until the police captured them on August 4, 1944. So for more than two years, the two families never went outside. All their food and supplies had to be brought to them. 
During this period, Anne Frank told her diary all of her thoughts and fears. Like any teenage girl, she hoped that good things would happen to her, that she would become a writer or a movie star. She complained that her parents treated her like a child. She insisted that she was grown up. She also talked about how difficult it was to live in a small area with seven other people and not to be able to go outside. She wrote about the war and hoped the Netherlands would soon be liberated from the Germans. Anne sometimes envied her older sister Margot, who was so much more mature and who never got into trouble. She and Margot wrote letters to each other to pass the time and even had a romance with Peter Van Pels, who was 17. Then all their fears came true. All the eight Jews hiding in the house were arrested and eventually sent to Auschwitz death camp in Poland. Although the war was ending, it did not end soon enough for the Frank family. Only Otto Frank survived the war. One of their helpers, Miep Gies, saved Anne's diary and kept it. After the war, Otto Frank decided to publish it. Since 1947, more than 20 million copies had been sold in 55 languages. Anne's diary shows the terrible cost of hatred, persecution, and war better than any history. Charlotte Church Many years ago, a German opera impresario was asked why so many of his leading ladies were physically unattractive. He replied, the ones who look like horses sing like nightingales, and vice versa. Certainly a good voice doesn't always go with an attractive appearance, but in our day of media images, good looks seem very important. Charlotte Church recorded her first album when she was 12 years old. It was called Voice of an Angel. Everyone agreed that the little girl has a very big voice, and they were delighted that Charlotte not only sounded like an angel, she also looked like one. Her sweet schoolgirl appearance and winning smile are part of her success. Charlotte Church was born in Cardiff, Wales, in February 1986. Music and singing are very important in Welsh culture, and all of Charlotte's family were musical. Although Wales is part of Great Britain, the Welsh people are very proud of their own language, history, and heritage. Now that Wales has its own parliament in Cardiff, Welsh culture is promoted even more strongly. Charlotte sings some of her songs in the Welsh language. Charlotte began singing along with the radio as an infant, and by the age of three, she could sing a number of popular songs. She began singing lessons when she was nine. Charlotte first appeared on television early in 1997. This led to a number of other TV and concert appearances. In 1998, she signed a contract with Sony to record five albums. Since Charlotte's first album appeared, she has spent a lot of time doing promotional tours. Since she's a schoolgirl, her two tutors travel along with her. Voice of an Angel was recorded in five days in Cardiff, Wales. All the songs were ones that Charlotte already knew and liked. These included Pie Jesus, The Lord's Prayer, Jerusalem, and Danny Boy. The album came out on November 9, 1998, and within a couple of weeks was number four on the popular music charts. She recorded her second album, Charlotte Church, in 1999. Traveling involves doing showcases for people in the music industry and the media. This is to encourage people to promote your music. Charlotte also appeared on various U.S. talk shows, including David Letterman and Jay Leno. She finds that she gets asked the same questions over and over again. Besides media celebrities, Charlotte has met many leading public figures. Since she is a Roman Catholic, Charlotte was especially excited to meet the Pope. This was after she'd been invited to sing at a Christmas concert at the Vatican. She was also asked to sing at Prince Charles' 50th birthday party in 1998. She saw the Prince again in 1999 when she sang at the official opening of the Welsh National Assembly. Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip talked to her, too. Later that year, she sang for Bill and Hillary Clinton at the Ford Theater in Washington. Something that people like about Charlotte Church is that when she hasn't been spoiled by fame, many show business kids are loud, 
brash, noisy, and rude. But when she is away from the stage, the young singer leads a normal life with her family and friends. Even when she is on TV, she comes across as an ordinary teenager, but a very nice one. Charlotte's voice always gets comments. It seems like such a big voice for a little girl. Very few teenagers have a powerful operatic voice like hers. Some people have found it hard to believe that it is actually Charlotte singing. For the most part, she enjoys her success. She likes to travel and meet new people. Los Angeles is her favorite city, and she likes the United States and Canada. But she is always glad to get home to Wales and be with her friends. At the moment, she goes to an all-girls school, so she doesn't see boys very often. But at age 15, an interest in boys is likely to become a factor in her life. Charlotte now has recorded three albums, and we can expect a fourth in 2001. She also has written an account of her life for all her fans. It is entitled "Voice of an Angel: My Life So Far." Christmas holidays. In many ways, Christmas is the most important holiday in North America. It is the most important commercial festival. Most retail stores do half their annual business in the six weeks or so before Christmas. Christmas is an important holiday from work and school. Many workers take the whole week off between Christmas and New Year's Day. It is the biggest time of the year for parties, gift giving, home decorations, and visiting. Many homeowners compete to see who can have the best display of lights. It is also an important time for the entertainment industry. Many Christmas movies, TV shows, recordings, concerts, and plays are produced every year for the Christmas season. It is also the time of year when the largest number of people attend church, because Christmas is a religious festival too. It celebrates the birth of Jesus. How all these different things came together to become Christmas is a long story. Why, for example, is Jesus's birthday celebrated on December twenty-fifth? No one knows the exact day that Jesus was born, but Jesus was born during the Roman Empire, and for the Romans, December twenty-fifth was a very important day. The Romans had many gods and many religions. Two religions, both of which had one main god, were the worship of the invincible sun and Mithras. These gods were both honored on December twenty-fifth. Because December twenty-fifth was just after the shortest day of the year, it was a natural time to worship the sun. December was also a time to celebrate the end of the agriculture year. The Romans held one of their main festivals, the Saturnalia, beginning on December seventeenth. That lasted for a week. The Romans also began the custom of celebrating New Year's Day on January first. So the last half of December and the beginning of January was a wonderful time for partying and games. The early Christians didn't know what day Jesus was born. At first, they celebrated his birthday on January sixth. However, as most people in the Roman Empire were becoming Christians, it was decided to move the date to December twenty-fifth. The celebration lasted twelve days until January sixth. And took the place of all other festivals. That way, people who were used to celebrating on December twenty-fifth would feel more comfortable. As different peoples became Christian, they brought their own customs to be part of Christmas. The people of Northern Europe used evergreen trees and mistletoe as symbols of spring and eternal life. The evergreen tree became the Christmas tree. The mistletoe is hung from the ceiling at Christmas for couples to kiss under. It was also in Northern Europe where the idea of Santa Claus or Father Christmas began. In Roman times, there was a man who became known as Saint Nicholas. He is said to have given gifts to the poor and provided dowries for poor girls who wouldn't otherwise be able to marry. The idea of the gift-giving saint became joined with the northern idea of spirit of Christmas festivities. It was a poem written in 1831 by the American writer Clement Moore, which popularized Santa Claus throughout the world. Twas the night before Christmas, 
told the story of how Santa visits every house in the world on Christmas Eve and brings toys for good girls and boys. Since that time, parents have secretly bought toys for their children at Christmas. When the children awake on Christmas Day, they find toys by the chimney or under the Christmas tree. They are told that Santa Claus and his reindeer brought them. Adults also give gifts to each other at Christmas time. No wonder that the store sells so many things then. It is often said that Christmas is becoming too commercialized. In the rush to get everything ready, to buy the gifts, decorate the house and tree, give parties, visit family and friends, and attend special Christmas events, the original reason for celebrating is sometimes forgotten. Only when people go to church or sing Christmas carols or attend musical performances about Jesus' birth do they remember that Christmas is the birthday of Christ. Garage Sales and Yard Sales Every Saturday morning in our part of the world, except in winter, many people drive around the city looking for yard sales. Yard sales or garage sales often take place in the driveway of someone's home or perhaps the front lawn. The homeowners take out all the stuff they don't want and arrange it in front of their house. Usually they put a price tag on items. People driving by will stop to see if there's anything they want. Many people spend every Saturday morning shopping at yard sales. If they find that they have bought too many things, then they have a yard sale of their own. Some of the shoppers are dealers who buy things for resale. Sometimes they resell them at their own yard sales, but some dealers are professionals who run antique stores, used bookshops, flea markets, or used furniture and appliance stores. Usually, the dealers will try to get to the yard sale before anyone else. That way, they have the best selection. Often, they'll try to buy items for less than what the price tag says. The cheaper they can buy the item, the more profit they can make when they resell it. Their motto is, buy low, sell high. Sometimes a merchant will boast that he paid one dollar for a glass or a china cup at a yard sale and sold it for a hundred dollars at his store or on the internet. By having catalogs that show the value of collectibles, dealers can sometimes make large profits. Now, however, many of the people having yard sales will try to check the value of the things they are selling first, so it is getting harder to get a real bargain. One reason for yard sales is that North Americans often live in big houses which fill up with things. People may use the basement, the attic, the spare room, and the garage to store things that they aren't using. If they store things in their garage, all they have to do is open the garage door and have a garage sale. When children grow up and move away, the parents will often sell the children's old clothes, toys, and furniture. Another reason for yard sales is that there are a lot of things that people might like but don't want to pay full price for. For example, if someone likes to read novels, they may be happy to pay one dollar for a book at a yard sale rather than twenty or thirty dollars at a retail store. What sorts of things are sold at yard sales? Just about anything you might find in a house or yard. There are ornaments, china, home decorations, sports equipment, bicycles, games, dolls, toys, tables and chairs, lamps, appliances, books, records, paintings, clothes, record players, and much, much more. Some items are things that were popular a few years ago, but now have gone out of fashion. This might include many toys, books, and games that relate to an old television show that is no longer being shown. While a lot of older people go to yard sales, so do a lot of students. Students and young people may need cheap furniture for their apartment or a bicycle to get to school or work. They may not be able to pay full price. If you are lucky, you can find almost anything at a yard sale. The trick is to get there early. Most yard sales are advertised to start at 9 a.m., but dealers may arrive as early as 7.30 a.m., by 10 a.m., the busiest part is already over, although most yard sales go on into the afternoon. Yard sales tend to prove the common saying that one person's trash is another person's treasure. 
Helen Keller What would it be like to be unable to see anything, hear anything, or say anything? Life for young Helen Keller was like that. She had an illness before she was two years old that had left her deaf, dumb, and blind. After that, it was difficult for her to communicate with anyone. She could only learn by feeling with her hands. This was very frustrating for Helen, her mother, and her father. Helen Keller grew up in Alabama, USA, during the 1880s and 1890s. At that time, people who had lost the use of their eyes, ears, and mouth often ended up in charitable institutions. Such a place would provide them with basic food and shelter until they died, or they could go out on the street with a beggar's bowl and ask strangers for money. Since Helen's parents were not poor, she did not have to do either of these things, but her parents knew they would have to do something to help her. One day, when she was six years old, Helen became frustrated that her mother was spending so much time with a new baby. Unable to express her anger, Helen tipped over the baby's crib, nearly injuring the baby. Her parents were horrified and decided to take the last chance open to them they would try to find someone to teach Helen to communicate. A new school in Boston claimed to be able to teach children like Helen. The Kellers wrote a letter to the school in Boston asking for help. In March of 1887, a teacher, 20-year-old Ann Sullivan, arrived at the Kellers' home in Tuscumbia, Alabama. Ann Sullivan herself had a very difficult life. Her mother had died when she was eight. Two years later, their father had abandoned Anne and their little brother Jimmy. Anne was nearly blind and her brother had a diseased hip. No one wanted the two handicapped children, so they were sent to a charitable institution. Jimmy died there. At age 14, Anne, who was not quite blind, was sent to the School for the Blind in Boston. Since she had not had any schooling before, she had to start in grade one. Then she had an operation that gave back some of her eyesight. Since Anne knew what it was like to be blind, she was a sympathetic teacher. Before Anne could teach Helen anything, she had to get her attention. Because Helen was so hard to communicate with, she was often left alone to do as she pleased. A few days after she arrived, Anne insisted that Helen learn to sit down at the table and eat breakfast properly. Anne told the Kellers to leave, and she spent all morning in the breakfast room with Helen. Finally, after a difficult struggle, she got the little girl to sit at the table and use a knife and fork. Since the Keller family did not like to be strict with Helen, Anne decided that she needed to be alone with her for a while. There was a little cottage away from the big house. The teacher and pupil moved there for some weeks. It was here that Anne taught Helen the manual alphabet. This was a system of sign language. But since Helen couldn't see, Anne had to make the signs in her hands so she could feel them. For a long time, Helen had no idea what the words she was learning meant. She learned words like box and cat, but hadn't learned that they referred to those objects. One day, Anne dragged Helen to a water pump and made the signs for water while she pumped water over Helen's hands. Helen at last made the connection between the signs and the thing. Water was that cool, wet liquid stuff. Once Helen realized that the manual alphabet could be used to name things, she ran around naming everything. Before too long, she began to make sentences using the manual alphabet. She also learned to read and write using the square hand alphabet, which was made up of raised square letters. Before long, she was also using Braille and beginning to read books. Helen eventually learned to speak a little, although this was hard for her because she couldn't hear herself. She went on to school and then to Radcliffe College, she wrote articles and books, gave lectures, and worked tirelessly to help the blind. The little girl who couldn't communicate with anyone became, in time, a wonderful communicator. Trial by Jury
If you are a citizen of Canada or the United States, it is very likely that you will be summoned at some time for jury duty. A letter will come in the mail telling you to report to a certain place at a given time. There are legal penalties for not attending because jury duty is considered every citizen's responsibility. Often, a large number of people, perhaps several hundred, will be summoned at one time. When you arrive, you will join a lineup of others who are registering for duty. Eventually, you will get to a table and talk to an official. If you have a special reason for not being a juror, such as ill health, you may be excused at this point. Those not immediately exempted will become a part of a jury panel. Out of this panel, a number of juries of 12 people will be chosen. These will decide a variety of criminal cases over the next few weeks. What follows is the experience of one woman in a jury pool. She went ahead with others into a large courtroom where they spent the whole day. At the front of the courtroom were the judge and the lawyers for the prosecution and for the defense. One of the lawyers explained what the case was going to be about. The names of the jury panel were in a box at the front. When someone's name was called, they went up to the front of the courtroom. The person called up would then have a chance to explain why they couldn't serve as a juror if there was some reason preventing them. For example, one woman was dismissed because she knew the accused. The first jury to be chosen was for a burglary case. A panel member went forward and faced the accused. Then the lawyers in the trial decided whether the juror was satisfactory to them. At lunchtime, the panel was dismissed for an hour. The second jury was to try someone on a charge of murder. Usually, the panel was told approximately how long the trial might be. Since jurors are not usually paid, many would like to avoid being involved in a long trial. The woman was called forward and had to look the man accused of murder in the eye. This made her quite nervous. Judging by her expression, the two lawyers would decide whether they wanted her on the jury or not. The defense lawyer would try to choose someone who seemed sympathetic to the man accused. The prosecutor would prefer someone who was not sympathetic. The woman excused herself by saying she had a very young child to look after and no relatives to help. She was allowed to go home at the end of the day. Some people wonder whether it is fair for lawyers to dismiss jurors who may not be sympathetic in their cases. For example, defense lawyers may try to choose young people if they think these will be less severe to their clients. In the case above, the lawyers seem to prefer women to men. This means that a lot of people are dismissed from being jurors without a good reason. One principle of the jury system, however, is to protect the rights of the accused particularly well. One might say that the jury system is biased in favor of the defendant. This is why defense lawyers have an opportunity to dismiss people who they think will not be favorable to their clients. Furthermore, having 12 jurors gives the defense a good opportunity for a successful defense. If the defense attorney can raise a reasonable doubt about the guilt of his client in even one juror, then the accused has a chance of being released. This happened in the O.J. Simpson murder trial. There, even though there was strong evidence that Simpson committed the crime, the defense was able to insinuate some doubts among the jurors. Moreover, the defense lawyers may be able to appeal to the emotions of the jurors, particularly if they can think of a way to gain sympathy for their client. For this reason, defense lawyers are more likely to choose trial by jury over trial by judge alone. A judge is less likely to be swayed by emotion than a jury, and a defense attorney may also prefer a criminal trial to a civil suit. In the latter case, the client does not have to be proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, but will be found liable if the preponderance of evidence is against him or her. This is why O.J. Simpson was acquitted on criminal charges, but then found liable for damages in a civil suit. Civil. A favorite place. It is good to have a favorite place where you can go to be alone and relax. Sometimes this spot is your own room 
or a quiet part of the house. Sometimes it is somewhere outdoors, away from people and busy streets. Or you may feel most comfortable in a shopping mall or a downtown park. Our favorite place is especially nice to go at times of stress. When work gets too hectic or we have trouble with other people, then our favorite place is a refuge from these difficulties. My special spot is very close to where I work. It is on a busy university campus. At one end of the university, hidden among several buildings, there is a pond. This pond is surrounded by large rocks, which rise up like a small cliff on one side. Shooting out of these rocks are water pipes, which create a small waterfall. The water is drawn up from the bottom of the pond and drops back into the middle. This keeps the water from becoming stagnant. On the other side of the pond, there is a grassy shore and a flat stone patio. Here, in the summer, people can sit out and have meals. Yet, very few people come here to sit, perhaps because they are very busy with their work. There is something very calm and pleasant about trees and grass and shade, about birds singing and water rippling, and flowers blooming all around. Green is a relaxing color for the eyes. Still water suggests peace. Running water seems full of life. There is a large weeping willow tree on the grassy side of the pond. Its branches touch the water and shade much of the pond. Rushes grow in the shallow water. The pond is only about three feet deep. In the summer, there are beautiful water lilies in bloom over much of the pond. Sometimes, I have counted over thirty blooms, and some flowers are over five inches wide. Goldfish and minnows are the pond's chief inhabitants. But there are also crayfish and other animals. At different times there have been a turtle, a water snake, and a family of ducks. Behind the pond is a large, glassy wall which reflects the entire scene. One can also go inside and view the pond, even on rainy or snowy days. There are several gardens close to the pond. One of the gardeners told me that he could turn the waterfall off and on. Usually on the weekends it is turned off, but if there is a special event, the waterfall is left on. Behind the glassy wall is a cafeteria. Here, visitors to the university are sometimes taken for meals. The students do not use it. In the winter, the pond freezes over. Sometimes, if the winter is very cold, the pond freezes right down to the bottom. Then, most of the goldfish and minnows die. Usually, some survive in the mud at the bottom of the pond. Occasionally, people will skate on the pond if the ice is smooth. When spring comes, a lot of the old rushes and water lily leaves from the previous year are cleared away. This makes the pond more attractive and gives the new plants room to grow. If there are too many rushes, they are sometimes cut down in summer. Then visitors can see the water lilies better. Chances are that if you ever visit Brock University in St. Catharines, Ontario, you will hear about Pond Inlet. And if you come in the summer, you will probably see me there thinking about my next article. Business Ethics What do business and ethics have to do with each other? Business is about making profits. Ethics is about right and wrong. How are they connected? Well, business ethics is the study of right and wrong as applied to business actions. Some businessmen would say that there is no need for business ethics. If we don't break the laws of the country, we have nothing to worry about. However, we can do many bad things without breaking laws. 
In some countries, it would be legal for a businessman to pollute the land, sea, and air, to confine his workers to barracks, and to hire children to work in factories. But these things may not be right. On the other hand, it may be illegal for a businessman to do some good things. For example, his society may expect him to treat people unequally and discriminate against some ethnic or religious groups. In order to know what is right or wrong, we need a moral rule. This rule does not come from business itself, but from ethics. So we need a statement of what we believe to be right. The American Declaration of Independence in 1776 states an ethical principle. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. The Declaration further tells us that all men have a right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Principles such as these can be used in American politics and law to decide whether an action is right or wrong. Many companies have their own ethical guidelines. IBM, for example, outlines its corporate ethics under headings such as tips, gifts, and entertainment, accurate reporting, fair competition, and not boasting. So each employee knows what to do or not to do in various situations. Ethical choices are made on three levels. Individuals, by companies and by societies, make them. An individual might choose whether or not to accept a bribe. A company might decide whether or not to bribe government officials. A government or society might decide whether or not to outlaw bribery. Similar principles of right and wrong might be used at all three levels. For example, it might be decided that bribery is simply wrong in all situations. On the other hand, it might be decided to view the situation case by case. In other words, there is a strong ethical stand and a more tentative ethical stand. The strong ethical stand. Applies when you have a basic moral principle, and apply it to all situations. For example, you might believe that it was always wrong to let workers handle hazardous substances without any protection. The weaker stand would consider whether it is legal to do so. If it is legal to let workers handle dangerous materials, and this conforms to social expectations. Then the weak ethical stand would say, "No problem, as long as the law is not broken and no one strenuously objects, then everything is okay." However, in ethics, there is a principle called the moral minimum. This principle means that you should never harm another person knowingly. The only exception would be to protect some other people or yourself. So business ethics would say that the businessman who exposes his workers to hazardous chemicals is wrong; he is not practicing the moral minimum. Colonial Williamsburg. Travelers in the desert or the jungle sometimes see the remains of old cities. These cities were once large and prosperous, but something has changed. Perhaps the climate got drier or wetter. Perhaps the trade routes, which had brought merchants to the city, now went elsewhere. Perhaps enemies destroyed them, or perhaps disease or famine drove the people away. Other cities, which were once important, have become less so in time. Jamestown, Virginia, the first English colony in America, is now only an historic site. It began as the capital of Virginia. But when fire destroyed the government buildings in 1699, the capital was moved to nearby Williamsburg. Williamsburg was an important town for many years. The British governors lived there, and two of them worked on the plans for the town and its buildings. The College of William and Mary was established there in the 1690s, the second oldest college in America. As the capital. 
Williamsburg contained many public buildings, including a courthouse, a jail, a powder magazine, the governor's palace, and the government building. Of course, there were many private houses as well. From 1699 until 1780, Williamsburg was the capital of Virginia. Many people came there for government and legal business. It was also a social center with dances, fairs, horse races, and auctions. The governor and his wife provided expensive dinners and entertainment for their guests. Most of the important people in Virginia owned tobacco plantations. In 1612, John Rolfe had first raised tobacco to sell to England. Soon, tobacco farming was Virginia's most important business. Most planters were able to build large houses and buy slaves to do their work. One plantation owner is said to have owned 300,000 acres of land and 1,000 black slaves, as well as having large amounts of money. The planters were the leaders of this colonial society, and they resented British interference in their local government. When England imposed taxes on the American colonists in 1765, it was a Virginian, Patrick Henry, who spoke against them. His words, Give me liberty or give me death, helped to inspire the American Revolution. As complaints about British rule increased, it was Virginians who led the rebels. George Washington became commander of the Revolutionary Army and Thomas Jefferson drafted the Declaration of Independence in 1776. In 1780, the capital of Virginia was moved to Richmond. Williamsburg was now simply a small college town of local importance. Not much changed in Williamsburg for many years. In the 20th century, the Reverend Dr. Goodwin, who was the priest at the Williamsburg Church, had the idea of restoring Williamsburg to the way it appeared in colonial days. Goodwin approached John D. Rockefeller, Jr. with his idea, and Rockefeller agreed to finance this project. Beginning in 1926, the old buildings of Williamsburg were restored to their original form. First were the college buildings, then the Rally Tavern, the government building, the governor's palace, and so on. Buildings that had been destroyed over time were reconstructed from plans and descriptions. Soon the restored buildings were open to the public. Guides, dressed in 18th century costumes, show visitors through the buildings and gardens. Visitors can also travel to nearby tobacco plantations. Now, tourists who pay admission to visit this wonderful historic town finance much of the work of restoration and conservation.